Hey guys, welcome back. Been imaging now for about four days, four nights. Just wanted to share with you some of the progress and lessons learned with the new Skywatcher EQ6 and show some of the data that I'm collecting with the GT81. A couple of the issues that I thought I had from my first two observing nights was that I was seeing this drag with on the deck axis after switching from the flying bat over to the lobster claw. The deck axis seemed to hang. I had hoped that it was a cable snag issue and sure enough I went out inspected carefully while I don't have a, a smoking gun for that I did uh, make sure that particularly the two cables the USB and the power cable coming up from the side of the mount up to the uh, ultimate power box that they had enough slack so that when deck needed to rotate roughly 90 degrees it could do it and not tug on anything I suspect that is what was happening and ever since I took a little more care in making sure those cables had enough slack I haven't seen this issue since and so everything's been going well another issue I thought I had uh, was a flashing LED here on the side of the mount by the way this is what a manual looks like I have some good information in there like uh, oh I don't know on the second page uh, saying that the intermittent three flashes means sidereal tracking with the PEC enabled and there you have it that's exactly what I have so this is why I wasn't seeing the three intermittent flashes when I was doing the testing indoors I didn't have PEC enabled because I hadn't done any PEC training because it hadn't been outside I was doing serial tracking and it what did seem to work so I thought I had some sort of a power issue with the change in the way that I had connected it up electrically and uh, several of you appreciate all of you guys commenting and and uh, patiently and uh, politely pointing out that maybe I should read the manual that solves that problem which in fact turns out wasn't a problem just self-inflicted issues that I've been having I got a couple of changes I made I thought I would increase the exposure time from 300 seconds which had what I had been doing to 400 seconds and now I'm taking exposures of 400 seconds for all of the narrowband filters and I significantly cut down on the number of autofocus runs the temperature is not changing that much and there's not that much of a difference between individual filters so I'm saving some time by cutting down on the number of autofocus runs I make here is all of the focus data from Nina as you can see all of these curves look very nice and hyperbolic uh, there is a shift here because we start off with a cold front had blown through temperatures were a little bit colder and then we heated up as we do here in in texas and got back to quote normal unquote and so that's why there's this shift in uh, location shift in focus points here because of the temperature changes from uh, the first night over to the remainder of the nights and the interesting thing is if you take all of the focus points say so all the data no matter what filter it is all of the data and just plot it as a function of temperature you find out that you're pretty darn linear I mean even these three outlier points I wonder if they are legitimately there or not they are the oxygen filter but most of the oxygen data the the HA and the sulfur data all are lying right along this line which is about eight or so focuser steps per degree C and eight steps for this particular focuser is within it's considered kind of a small change it suggests that you could just do an autofocus run at the uh, with the hyperbolic curve at the start of an imaging night and then from then on make focuser adjustments based on temperature and you'd probably be okay on the guiding performance which is one of the things I've been keenly interested in given that this is all a restart for me with the new Skywatcher EQ6 I have been extremely impressed and this is a, a guiding at the end of one night and what you can see is that the uh, RA axis is 0.5 arc seconds, deck 0.31. Things are settling down now where the RA axis is has a higher error than the deck axis, which is what you would expect given that the RA axis is always running. And the total RMS error is about 0.6 arc seconds, which... I am totally happy with wouldn't change anything if I could maintain 0.6 RMS. I've been dividing my imaging time roughly 11 hours per night over three targets and I start off with the Flying Bat Nebula SH2-129 then go over to the Lobster Claw SH2-157 then finally pick up the Heart Nebula SH2-190 and you can see my summary of, of imaging hours spent in the three filters so far it's just the S H and O filters that I'm imaging at and I've got a total of 15 hours now on, on the flying uh, bat and I'm, the minimum time I've got is about 11.6 on the heart nebula and for the palette that I ultimately will will use when making the final image for the 
Flying bat, I think probably a lot of people use just the hydrogen alpha as the red and then split or put the oxygen in both the green and the blue to give you kind of a teal colored squid, if you can see the squid, uh, and a red colored uh, nebulosity surrounding it for the flying bat. Uh, when I did this last time, there is a decent, no, it's nothing is very strong here. There's a decent sulfur signal. And I think what I've done in the past is take the sulfur maybe at uh, 25%, for example, oxygen at 75%, or maybe it's a 50-50 split in the green channel and then put the oxygen only in the blue channel or oxygen only in the blue channel. And then this kind of gives you more of an orange colored uh, nebulosity as opposed to being more strongly red. Otherwise, I think it'd be perfectly legitimate, given the faint nature of the squid part of this target, to simply take all these hours out of the sulfur and give them over to the oxygen. And that's a perfectly legitimate strategy for attacking this particular target. Lobster Carl is turning out very well. There's good, decent signal, as you would expect. There's more in HA, but there's some in oxygen, some in sulfur. And the same with the heart nebula. I'm just spending less time on it. So in the next couple of days, when I get back out, I'll pick up more time on this and also go with the SHO combination, maybe with some RGB stars. But uh, I generally shoot 20 hours-ish, 20 hours plus for a given target, and I'm not quite there yet. So I've got these couple of days coming up, and I hope to uh, meet the total and pick up the uh, slack in my SH2190. Let's go over and take a look at some of the data that I'm getting in. So here's the first target of the night. This is what I have so far with my imaging. It is a stacked set of data. There are no, I have not done anything with the background yet, taking the background out. You'll notice that the image is, is rotated a bit. This is because I'm using the reference image from this target from last year, and I just didn't get the camera set exactly right. So I'm about two and a half degrees off with the current orientation relative to what I had before. You can see uh, there's a hint of a sulfur signal here for the flying bat. And uh, one of the things that I found, of course, we all have to contend with this. This is a pretty good airplane uh, streak in one of the frames going right through here. And you'll notice there's no hint of it. I included this frame in this stack of the sulfur data and it's not too bad. All right, The PixInsight pixel rejection algorithm does a pretty good job of eliminating this thing so that there's no hint that that plane trail went right through there. On HA there's certainly a stronger signal here for the uh, the flying bat and of course there's a plane flying through here. Again this is not nearly as challenging as it was for the sulfur but again there's no hint of it over here so that's fine. On the oxygen side things are looking very good. Also the flats are working very well. I'll talk more about this in an in a upcoming video about the Flatmaster. This is my first operational use of taking flats using the Flatmaster and things are going okay. There is a shadow of the off-axis guider up in this area. I think what we're seeing here is more of a light gradient than it is evidence that the shadow is not being fully removed. The squid is nowhere to be seen so far. It's I can I know where to look for it so I can see that there's something but it is darn faint and it's going to take some more hours which is why I, I hope to get uh, at least maybe eight more hours of oxygen over the next couple of days on this particular target because it sorely needs it and of course we had the obligatory plane fly through here and that data is included and I definitely don't want to be throwing out oxygen data. This is a target that I've been shooting or had shot from last time and if I look at the uh, oxygen data from last time, again, there's no real hint of the uh, squid in here. What you can see are some effects of, of uh, the flats, possibly, possibly the darks, not compensating for uh, the uh, the image shadow of the off-axis guider. It's overcompensating for the off-axis guider. Another problem I was continuing with is some illumination from a nearby moon, and that could very well be uh, responsible for, th for the flats not working as well. When I combine the data, this is what I have, and it is barely, I can see the squid a bit more here, but there's no way you can see it in, in your video version of this video. So uh, it's going to take a little more time and, and a heck of a lot of, of processing to, to try to pull that thing out. On the lobster claw, this is what I get for the sulfur data. I had no airplane strikes through this target, so that was good. Uh, some decent sulfur here. Obviously, there's a much better data going on with the HA. You've got the bubble nebula here and a couple of um, open clusters down here. 
and oxygen, not much in oxygen. This claw of the uh, lobster here looks pretty good. It's got some good oxygen signal to it, comparatively speaking. And I've just done a little bit of processing uh, just to play around with it. I'll be ditching these results later, but I am. Uh, it is nice to see some of the detail that will be coming out in this starless image, at least, of the uh, lobster claw. There's going to be some good nebulosity features here that we can play with during the processing stage. I think it shows a lot of promise. I'm getting some nice blues because of the oxygen signal here, and I think that's going to look nice in the long run. And then finally, of course, we have the heart nebula. This is the sulfur signal. And once again, uh, I get a little satellite trail. That's nothing. If we're handling those big planes, the satellite trail is not going to bother me. I get some good HA data. I've got a satellite trail going through here. This is the last picture I took, so right in the morning. And if you look closely down in here, these, this point here, here, and here, that's a strobe light going off. And if you zoom in on this area here, you can see the, uh, the shadow of the illuminated uh, engine nacelle by that strobe light. And then finally, there's a bit of oxygen here in the fish head and in the center of the heart nebula. And initial processing of it shows quite a bit of good detail that I think will be uh, fun to bring out and process and try to tease out some of this cloud structure that we see back in here uh, with a little more uh, improving the detail and playing a bit more with wavelets to try to bring some of these features out. Well, the uh, first lessons are the lessons that we all know. Uh, cable management is critical, and certainly I have a new setup with this new mount, so I should have paid more attention to how the deck axis, the deck axis and the RA axis move relative to each other for the targets that I'm going after, and therefore how the cables react to that movement. And I, I suspect I was seeing some tugging with uh, a couple of those cables and that was affecting some deck results bad deck results that i was getting also the blinking light is totally normal and i might have known that if i'd read the manual the uh, gt81 focusing is working very well with nina uh, it's it's very linear with temperature the, the change in focus and it'd be nice if nina had the uh, automated focus adjustment based on temperature now apt does this so that is an option for those of you who use apt and uh, it may be a, a selling point to go back and use APT. The EQ6R guiding is, is uh, very good. Uh, it's very promising. I'm getting uh, 0.6 RMS on some probably some pretty good guiding or seeing night, so uh, it's not too surprising, but it does show that if I were to, to retain this 0.6 RMS, I don't even I wouldn't even think about making any mechanical modifications to it. So we'll see how this goes over time and how it responds as I move up in telescope weight. The Pix Insight pixel rejection algorithm is doing a great job. I think there's a tendency for us when we do a blink through all the images we got over one night to just toss out any image that has a certainly a, a satellite trail or an airplane airplane trail through it. I've included those airplane trails and satellite trails, and they don't show up. So the the Pix Insight uh, rejection algorithm is doing a great job of taking those things out. So you might want to think next time when you have some data and it's got an airplane or satellite trail through it, don't just toss them out. It might be better to uh, let Pix Insight deal with those through their pixel uh, rejection algorithms. Uh, the Pegasus Astro Flatmaster, I think it's working pretty well. I'll uh, go into that in more detail in a follow-up video. But all in all, I'm getting pretty good data. I'm going to go out and collect some more SHO data and maybe if I get a a free couple of hours on the last imaging night, I'll get some RGB stars. And then we'll be on to the Explore Scientific ED-102 to see what it does. Okay, guys, well, thanks for showing up and listening, and I'll talk to you guys later. Clear skies.